back everyone this is the state of the nation now i have consistently held the belief that the imf was the wrong move unfortunately all mainstream political parties right now thinks otherwise we are witnessing the victory lap of the IMF at this moment. Most recently, we saw the cabinet gathered uh, the draft of the Central Bank Act to limit the printing of money and making the central bank a so-called independent institution. Independent meaning who exactly will the central bank be serving after that point? The IMF? Well, that sure seems to be the case. Doesn't it sometimes feel like that our government is essentially the mouthpiece for the IMF? We're clearly playing to their tune to secure the bailout money of $2.9 billion and mainstream politics are hell-bent on that being the right course of action with no other alternatives to consider. Now, as a concerned citizen, I have always wanted to consider alternatives and look at economic problems holistically. For that, I'm now joined by a senior academic researcher at the Global Development Policy Center at the University of Boston in the USA, Dr. Rebecca Ray. Thank you very much, Doctor, for your time. Um, doctor, the current situation in Sri Lanka is dire. Sri Lanka is now a nation that has defaulted. We don't seem to have any bilateral investment to pump up the dollars required for the economy to restart. The IMF has also implemented harsh tax, regi uh, tax regimes uh, that seems to kill the middle class. Now, what is your take on Sri Lanka's current situation and what do you think that this nation must do to come out of this current situation? The first thing to remember in this situation is that Sri Lanka is not alone. Across the world, a debt crisis is erupting due to basically two triggers that are outside of the control of debtor nations rising interest rates, very rapidly rising interest rates, and a rising cost of the US dollar. So loans that are in variable interest rates in dollars, as most bonds are, for example, are very rapidly becoming very unaffordable across the entire world. And so it's important for Sri Lanka to remember that it shouldn't have to take the punishment for a trigger that is essentially mostly out of its control. Now, we can look at Sri Lanka's previous IMF agreement from 2016 and see the kinds of conditions that are likely to be implemented in a new IMF agreement. That one in 2016 involved in some years, literally hundreds of billions of rupees cut from the central government budget. And we know what the impact of cuts like that are on economies in crisis. Slower recoveries, slower growth, higher poverty rates, higher inequality, that specifically hurts the middle class as public, uh, public employment and public spending is cut. So if there's anything that can be done to avoid those kinds of conditions, it will be very important for Sri Lanka to remember it doesn't have to take this punishment if it can avoid it. Absolutely, absolutely, Doctor. Uh, now, as a country, Sri Lanka is in discussion on bilateral free trade agreements, uh, especially with countries such as India, Singapore, and more importantly, China. Are FTA is a good way to go? And when doing so, what must we be mindful of? FTAs can be useful, particularly for small countries that are heavily economically tied to large neighbors if they can position themselves as an important hub for goods going into those neighbors, uh, for example, for the last stages of manufacturing processes. However, it is so important to get the details right because, for example, FTAs very frequently tie a country's hands and prevent them from pursuing the kind of industrial policy that would actually allow them to get and keep that manufacturing employment. Of course, as you know, Sri Lanka mostly exports low technology goods, whether they're agricultural goods like tea or manufact manufactured goods with low technology like textiles. If Sri Lanka wants to change that fact, it may need to use some of the industrial policies that, for example, China used in its industrialization. So it will be important not to prohibit yourself from pursuing those policies if Sri Lanka wants to move up that value chain, either with new supply chains related to renewable energy and electric vehicles, or simply greater technology in the supply chains where Sri Lanka is already active, like textiles and apparel. 
Absolutely. Uh, doctor, let's uh, talk uh, more about the China factor. Sri Lanka's current crisis, by the West especially, is blamed on Chinese loans, especially uh, the USA is saying this, although it's not even one-tenth of the external debt that Sri Lanka holds. Now, right now, Sri Lankan authorities are favoring the West and omitting China. Now, is this a prudent move? As you say, China accounts for about 10% of Sri Lanka's public foreign debt. Let's put that in context for a second. Multilateral creditors like the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, and the IMF account for 20%, twice as important as China, and they're not at the table. It's not being seriously discussed right now. Bondholders and private creditors account for 33% of Sri Lanka's foreign public debt. And while they've signed an agreement that says Yes, we're broadly in support of beginning negotiations. They haven't offered significant suspensions or haircuts yet. Dealing with 10% of the debt simply isn't enough. And as long as creditors are pointing fingers at each other, rather than all coming together to offer actual debt relief, it's not going to fix the problem. And so while it's convenient for the US and China and the Paris Club to focus attention on each other and say that each other should move first because no one wants to take the first haircut, the truth is Sri Lanka can't move forward without the participation of all of these groups. It is important for multilaterals to step up. The chief economist of the World Bank has said so. It's important for bondholders to do more than simply support the general concept of cooperation, although that's a crucial first step. And yes, of course, it's important for China to also participate. But to put the responsibility of a stalled process on 10% of the problem is clearly not going to fix the whole problem. Indeed, uh, makes a lot of sense. And we actually have to have a bigger conversation. Doctor, appreciate your th uh, time. Thank you very much. That was the uh, Senior Academic Researcher at the Global Development Policy Center at the University of Boston in the United States, Dr. Rebecca Ray. We will take a short commercial break. This is the State of the Nation. Back in a moment.